politics and conflicts. We're going to look at um, how politics are causing some conflicts within the British Empire as well as conflicts with other empires as well. So first of all, looking just at the British Empire overall, um, there was really this idea that politics should be similar to that of a family structure, that rulers are supposed to govern with the same kind of like fairness and benevolence that a father would presumably have towards their own family. The ruler is the father of the family. And then of course, in return, the people of a nation or empire are supposed to owe their allegiance um, to their rulers, just like you would have a child be obedient to their parents. So when we look at this in the setup of England, we have the crown that represents the royal family. And then in parliament, there's basically two different houses. There is the aristocracy that is in the House of Lords. And then there's the common people that are represented in the House of Commons. Now keep in mind, you still would only be able to vote in these kinds of things if you own land and prestige. So it's not just like all the way across that anyone can have a vote in democracy and everything. Now the thing is, in the Americas, in the American colonies, or really the British colonies, keep in mind I'm using these terms interchangeably, they had the same view, but this is a lot harder to pen to practice because there is no aristocracy in the British colonies. Literally the elites are just like two, maybe three generations removed from very humble beginnings. And then on top of that, land ownership is a lot more widespread. And so you have in most of the colonies, it's anywhere between 50 to 75% of white men there would be eligible to vote. The other issue is that we have this idea of virtual representation versus actual representation. So let me go into what these are. Virtual representation was what England really had in place. The idea was that a representative served the interest of the nation as a whole not just a locality in which they come from. We talk about, you know, Amer America as, you know, no, no taxation without representation and everything. But the thing is, there were a lot of places in England itself that didn't necessarily have representation. Uh, for instance, cities like Manchester didn't have any kind of representative at all, and yet once imported towns would still send representatives all the same. Um, the idea though was that, okay, let's say if modern day we did virtual representation and the Senator of Texas went to Washington DC, the idea with virtual representation is that he wouldn't just represent, he or she wouldn't just represent Texas, but would represent the entirety of the United States and that all of the legislation they would put forward and everything would benefit, you know, Florida to California to Texas to New York. Now you might be going, wait a second, but isn't Texas the only one, you know, electing them? So yeah, there's some issues with this idea of virtual representation. It's great in theory, if everyone can, you know, rise above and everything, but maybe not so great in practice. And that's the thing is basically Americans or British colonists at this time. So Americans, I'm gonna start calling them Americans now, but they are British colonists. Um, they are still part of the British empire they experienced more actual representation. They believed that elected representatives should be directly responsive to local interests, and they were skeptical of virtual representation working. And so with actual representation, in that case, no, the representative from Texas really represents Texas and is going to do what is best for Texas and not necessarily the nation as a whole. Now, the thing is, so you can already see there's some issues lining up here. And then on top of that, you have the governorships here in the American colonies. The thing is all the colonies, except for Connecticut and Rhode Island, either a king or a proprietor had appointed the governor of the colony. And so this means that these governors' interests really laid with their English patrons rather than the colonists themselves, because that's who put them in that position of power. And yet they are gonna exercise a great amount of power over these colonial assemblies. Um, because they've been put in place by like either the king or a proprietor, 
basically these governors a lot of times had like instructions on how they were supposed to govern and this really limited their ability to negotiate with the colonists. Now the thing is when you had a very much an agenda that you're only supposed to do this, this, and this, a lot of times in a position like a governorship, what you would do is you would control a lot of offices and prizes and basically buy allegiance to your side. However, most of these governors in the American colonies controlled very few offices and therefore very few prizes to buy allegiance with. Uh, they are going to struggle over time to really dominate the growing size of the colonial population. And in fact, to make things even worse for these governors and more complicated, a lot of times um, they were financially dependent on the American assemblies who would appropriate money for the governor's salaries. So yeah, they were put in place by the proprietor of the king, but they were paid from the colonial standpoint. So you can see how this is gonna be problematic. And so as a response to a lot of this, a lot of times colonists might send uh, people to England to lobby directly on behalf of colonial interests. But generally, most of the times the response was just the American or British colonists accepted these political ties as long as parliament treated them as a partner in the their empire and they and you know refrained from ruling by like coercion or anything however we're saying in the middle of the 18th century so those mid 1700s the population of the colonists is growing rapidly and it is spreading out over vast amounts of land and this is going to be problematic because now the british is going to be harder to control the american colonists but it also alarms other European powers as well. So I ask you this question, was the American Revolution at this point already inevitable? Could we have avoided it? I want you to think about that. And now I tell you, this is a terrible question. Generally speaking, I go ahead and I always include this question because it's a bad question. The thing is we want to actually avoid the word inevitable in history because it basically takes human agency out of the equation. Uh, for instance, you might say it is inevitable that Mrs. Elkins is going to teach the rest of this class. The thing is technically at any point I could just go, nope, and I could quit my job and leave. Am I going to do that? No, I, I really am not. But I could because I have agency over my life and I have freedom of choice. So just kind of keep in mind when you're writing, try not to ever say anything is inevitable. Um, you can say it's very likely, things like that. And so that's why instead, I actually want you to answer on your journal this second question. On a scale of one to 10, how likely was the American Revolution at this time in your opinion? So this would be one would be very, 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 very unlikely and 10 would be very, very, very likely. So on a scale of one to 10, how likely was the American Revolution at this time in your opinion? Take a second to make note of that and then I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Feel free to pause if you need longer. I'm gonna go ahead and move forward though. So uh, the thing is, I mentioned that this is alarming other European powers. The thing is all of these empires, the British empire, the Spanish empire, the French empire, those are three we're gonna really look at, but you can even see on the map to the right how other empires are getting involved as well. Um, they're all becoming closer and closer together. And this is intensifying the competition for land, uh, trade resources, and specifically Native American allies. Now we can see this first in great, uh, the British Empire with the British moving to the back country. The thing is the population of the American colonies is growing partly through natural increase, but partly because of immigrants coming in. Uh, quick thing on this, there was actually a few sources that you can find in Pennsylvania at this time that they were really concerned about all these German immigrants coming in and they're not changing their language or their customs and oh my gosh, they might Germanize us. Hopefully you recognize there's a bit of a similarity there to some things that go on today. 
Um, so the more things change, the more things stay the same at the same time. But basically, most of this natural increase, a lot of times people would move further out west into what is known as the back country. <coughs> Um, here they would raise crops and livestock, livestock generally for subsistence, more on small isolated farms. A lot of times they didn't even own the land. It was they were squatting until they could maybe claim it in their own right. Um, it's very similar to when we get our first, you know, colonies being set up. It generally was young men roughing it on their own at first. Uh, we do see tension very early on between the backcountry and the older seacoast communities just because their interests are colliding. Um, a lot of times the backcountry would complain about, you know, rich Eastern planters that are dominating the colonial legislatures and ignoring their Western demands. But at the same time, you know, the people of the backcountry were doing things like encroaching on Indian lands, displacing natives, leading to conflict with Native Americans. Um, though they weren't always in conflict with Native Americans, sometimes as they expanded out West, they could pursue trade with Indians. However, that, in many ways, was actually more problematic when it came to competition against the Spanish and the French, who really feared this commercial expansion. If you look on the map to the right, you can see Spain at this time was really moving into Texas and Florida by the mid-18th century. Uh, this map is specific. Yeah, you can see is like 1750, so right there, mid-18th century. Um, you can see that they have Florida, although Florida's interior was really effectively controlled by Native Americans more than anything else. And um, they still have a slight hold on New Mexico, but it's suffering from the Pueblo Revolt still. Basically, the reason they moved so much into Texas is because they wanted a buffer zone between them and the French. Texas was extremely difficult to fill, though, because <laughs> they couldn't guarantee Spaniards safety when they moved into Texas. As you probably know, Texas is very large. California, they basically set up a string of forts and missions from, you know, San Diego to San Francisco, so really more along the coast. They have that whole area colored in yellow, but it's a lot more spotty than that, really. Um, they faced very little opposition at first from California's Native Americans. They would erect these extensive missions once again, to convert and educate Indians and then set them to work. The unfortunate thing here is that Native Americans' fate oftentimes was even worse than slaves. There was a lot of sexual exploitation by the Spanish soldiers, and any kind of resistance against the Spanish um, would meet a quick and cruel punishment. That being said, as much as Spain has a lot of military might, they really couldn't compete with the vigorous commercial empires of both France and England. Which, speaking of France, the thing is France really followed the waterways. You can see what's green is going along the water. They had gone down the Mississippi Valley in the 1670s. They had then set up outposts along the Gulf Coast. Uh, they established New Orleans in 1718. The thing is, France was really worried about defending all this land, so they actually forbade colonists from moving into the interior section up the Mississippi River, but French colonists did it anyway. Um, we're seeing this expansion, though, amongst the uh, Mississippi Valley River, I'm sorry, the Mississippi River Valley. Basically, you can see it's drawing a wedge between what the Spanish holdings were because Florida is now not touching the rest of Spain's um, holdings, so just kind of keep that in mind. It also is blocking the Western movement of the English with the British colonies. Really, uh, France's holdings, though, in this area, it was only as strong as their Indian allies on which it rested. So basically, the Indians um, allowed the French like free passage through their lands but if that policy was ever to end, their empire would be divided between the north and the south. 